Uh, we will go through this presentation. You're welcome to ask questions in the chat. Uh, me and Tarek will monitor the chat and then, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So welcome everybody and hopefully we'll have a good session. Perfect. All right, uh, Mike, thanks a lot. Thanks to the whole ACE team, Sam, Jonas and Pierre and everybody involved. Um, you guys are doing a great job over there in Canada, trying to keep everybody busy and most importantly, educating everybody. So it's an honor to be here um, and with these college coaches, um, helping you guys get educated on the college recruitment process. I know it's a very difficult time for everybody, not only in life, but also, you know, those who are trying to get into college. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainties that we're gonna talk about and um, hopefully give you guys a little bit of advice and knowledge and uh, whatever expertise we have um, given the situation to help you navigate this properly. Um, I'll just give a quick, you know, further background about what I'm doing to help and uh, how it works. Um, so as, as Mike said, I'm born and raised in Canada and um, I played college tennis in the US and I basically never left. I came back home for about a year and a half, but I found myself, um, you know, helping student athletes navigating the process, Americans, internationals. And I've been doing that since 2009, and uh, that's with my company, I'm Recruitable. And basically, the goal is to empower student athletes. So, you know, for the parents out there listening, um, I have realized, learned um, over my years being an athlete and being in the business that um, you have to empower the student athletes to do the process, to get educated first and foremost, so they can make the right decision, so that they can find the best fit college for themselves. Um, college tennis has one of the highest, if not the highest, transfer rates out of all college sports. And one of the reasons is because it's an individual sport that turns into a team sport, and uh, we have to be more educated. So with I'm Recruitable, um, we have a platform and network that allows players to jump on and uh, build a profile, get connected with coaches and discover and communicate with them. So it helps that education process, helps you get connected, and it's a great tool and opportunity. And um, further, I've sort of been helped with the OTA over the last few years. We've really been working hard and, and along with uh, these organizations like ACE to really help you guys get more and more educated. If there's one thing you're going to walk away with today, it should be education because knowledge is power. And therefore, you guys, if you're walking away with some information that you normally didn't have, uh, that's a great start. You're never going to learn everything in recruiting, but you are going to help your situation you're going to help find the best fit and that's what we're here to do and that's why these great college coaches have you know given their time to help you guys out when i made the call to them with the help of the ace team i said uh would you do it and not one of these guys hesitated so they're all very well um as you notice with their resumes they have great accolades they've been in the business for a long time and they've recruited internationals so, you know, without further ado, I want to start the education process. I'm just going to talk about a couple quick things and then we'll go into asking the coaches some questions. So I'm going to quickly share my screen so it can add some context. And I'm just going to direct you guys to, um, what screen are you guys looking at here? Is everyone seeing the I'm Recruitable website? Okay, great. So over here, I've, I've put up with my team a COVID-19 NCAA and then NAIA updates. So if you click over there, I've put in some basic information and links to both the NCAA and the NAIA uh, dedicated pages for COVID-19 where they're releasing updates. So all the current information you can get from these resources and you can get that directly by going onto imrecruitable.com and then learning from there. Um, further, if you guys want to do some more research on how to make a video and information about college uh, tennis specifically, you can always click on the links that I have created here that give you guys inside information on, you know, how to make a good video for coaches and why players pick, you know, to play their sport, what the numbers look like. All of this information will help you, you know, build a good foundation. Um, when you log in, hopefully many of you have already created accounts, and if you haven't, um, I'll just give you a quick run through. You know, we have, you can build a profile right here specifically that college coaches can, can look at, and they can easily decide and vet whether you're a prospect for their team or not by putting in all your important information. This is what college coaches look for initially when they're scouting you. 
um, you can research colleges. So now that you have tons of time and you're not, you know, uh, unfortunately you're not on the tennis courts, but you have more time on hand, you should be spending a lot of time doing research. So, you know, we have all the colleges that play college tennis in our database. Um, you can get an overview about the school, the location, recruiting information, like here I got Coach Carney who's joining us today, his office number, his, his uh, email address, costs, financials, etc. So you can do your research here. The next thing you can do is you can view the activity that coaches are performing against your profile. So it's nice to be able to see which coaches are viewing your profile, who's following you and has some serious interest, who's searching players like yourself or you. And this is really important because now you can start tracking what your market value is, what coaches are actually interested, where you fit in. Are you a Division I player, Division II? Are you all of the above, et cetera? And then lastly, you can build a list of colleges. So as you start gaining traction from these coaches and you start doing your research, you can start creating a list of favorite schools. Um, unfortunately, coaches, it's not shared with you guys. It's a personal thing, but it's a great way to manage your recruitment process and take the first step. So, you know, I encourage everybody to, to first and foremost, jump on, you know, the website, do some research, learn about it. You can build a free profile and you can learn about uh, what's happening with the coronavirus right now and get connected to these great coaches. So I wanted to at least share that information with you guys. And if anybody wants to contact me and my team afterwards, you can simply, you know, uh, click the contact us down here and you can, you can definitely get in, connect, uh, in contact with us. I am available to help people, you know, navigate this and, and answer any questions you guys have. Okay. So I'll stop the screen share there um, for a second. So I just want to add that context. Now, I think it's important for us to go into the first big topic and um, I'll ask the coaches, I was starting with uh, Coach Carney there to talk a little bit about what's happening in the NAIA regarding the coronavirus and what the latest news is from them. If you can give a quick summary, that would be great. Oh, I think we got his voice or no? Ryan, you're muted, man. Okay, we'll give him, a, maybe we'll start with Coach uh, Avi then, and we'll come back to you, Ryan, when you're ready. Good, I'm good. Can you hear me now? Okay, there you are. So, yeah, the, the NAI just announced uh, last Friday some eligibility changes because of uh, players' inability to take the SAT and ACT. So, uh, typically, you would have to have a, a 970 on the SAT um, and be ranked in the top half of your class, either one of those two things, um, in addition to having a 2.0 GPA. Um, because of the testing situation, the only requirement you have now uh, to be eligible for next year is to have a 2.0 GPA. So uh, I'm going to venture a guess that everyone here has that. So uh, that is very lenient in terms of uh, eligibility under the circumstances and, and makes it easy for players, uh, especially in some countries where there may not be a class ranking system. Okay, great. Um, Coach Avi uh, from the Division II side, what has been the latest news? Yeah, I believe it's, uh, it's about the same, you know, uh, also the schools uh, are waiving the SAT um, uh, test, you know, to get accepted to the school, but with uh, the NCAA, it's, it's much more easier to, to be eligible right now. Um, uh, also, the NCAA uh, is giving all of the student athletes that uh, went through the, this spring season uh, and didn't complete it, they're giving them that year back. So the seniors are getting it automatically. Everybody else will have to do a favor, but they will get it. So that kind of changed a little bit the whole looking forward for recruiting and things like that. Um, but with NCAA, just, you know, yeah, the, test, the testing um, uh, will be waived kind of, um, and it's a little bit going to be much easier to be eligible. Okay, great. And uh, Coach Matt Hill, uh, what's happening in the D1 world? Yeah, it's the same, obviously, with uh, not being able to take the SAT that's being waived. The uh, GPA requirement is a 2.3. Um, and then, of course, the 10 core courses still need to be taken prior to the senior year. So that's your math, science, and Englishes. And then um, you do have to still graduate on time. There's no leniency as it relates to graduating late uh, for the Division One side. And then 
as it relates to getting the year back, all athletes uh, did get the year back as well. Um, so that, of course, same thing for us, changes a little bit on the recruiting side. I, I don't think it changes too much for the athletes that are trying to come this fall or this spring because the seniors that are coming back, their scholarships are exempt from the four and a half scholarships that we're allowed to give out. So we, if we had money left over to, to still sign more players, we can still do that. If, even if the seniors come back, they're exempt. But it's really if you're a junior in high school and you're already having conversations with coaches and you've already been talking scholarship offers, I think that's the class that's really we're seeing a lot of effect because those numbers are changing. And, um, yeah, we don't even know. Like if, if you don't know if your juniors are going are gonna to take advantage of that extra year they've been given, you don't really know how much money you have to work with that, with that class. So it's, or that's really the challenging year for us as we're talking with all our juniors on how do we offer and how do we decide, you know? Okay. Yeah. So I'll stick with you for a sec, coach, uh, Matt, uh, cause I want to ask, so what is, you know, yeah. What are the challenges? So for the current, you know, 2020s, let's just say in the division one world. Now I know there's different, um, we got to talk a little bit different about the power five schools and mid majors and so on. So talk about what you think is happening with kids that are still trying to get recruited that are 2020s in the D one world. What's going to happen as you started to talk about for the 2021 grads, which is the juniors and beyond. What about the sophomores and beyond? You can sort of touch on what you think the whole landscape is going to look like. And we knowing that these are opinions, not facts because things are going to, evolve as we go around along but what is your insight what are you thinking is going to happen well the 2020s obviously they're not getting to execute um official visits and we're not able to do home visits you know and that's till may 31st right now that we're in a dead period till may 31st we can sign people to an nli now officially by april 15th but no off-campus or on-campus recruiting till may 31st right now and we I just got off a head coach's meeting literally right before I jumped onto this and that hasn't, that, that date isn't, isn't, uh, we haven't heard any changes yet on that. So I think if you are waiting to take an official visit before you made a decision, you don't know when that's going to be. So, um, I think maybe you got to use other means to decide how to, how to make a decision without maybe visiting campus. Maybe you do a, I, I, I did a virtual tour with a kid from Spain the other day where I literally went around campus myself on the phone with video and just kind of showed them around that way. And, um, but yeah, it's, um, so I think that's how that class is affected because you just don't know when you can get back on campus. So you might have to make decisions in a different manner. Um, the 21 class is affected because of the reasons I already mentioned with the scholarships, the uncertainty around that, and they can't take their visits right now either. Um, and then the sophomore freshman class, the younger kids, I mean, yeah, it's impossible to say what uh, college athletics as a whole is going to look like after coming out of this. There's a lot of economic impact going on internally with uh, the different departments. And that's, that doesn't matter if you're a power five school like us, where we, you know, we're losing seven, eight million dollars just this year alone. Um, or if you're a smaller school with a smaller budget, whether you're in Division One, Two, Three, or NAI school, you know the economic impact is it's it's definitely it's definitely real and it's there. And so it'll be interesting to see how it's going to be a university, you know, case by case basis on how they choose to pivot and and get creative and innovative on how they absorb those costs and how they um, streamline efficiencies in the future. I would say. Okay, and just before I move on to the next coach, Coach Matt, can you just explain, somebody was asking a question, um, what does it mean by getting the year back when you said that? If you can just yeah. follow so, that. So we stopped our season in March. We were in the middle of our season. And so essentially the NCAA said, okay, this season essentially didn't happen from an eligibility standpoint. You have five-year clock, four years to play, and this year didn't count as one of your years to play. So that's why – the verbiage I was using was you get the year back. So if my guys that were juniors this year and we're going to be seniors next year, now technically by all, you know, all accounts with the NCAA from an eligibility standpoint, they're going to be juniors eligibility wise next year. They'll still have two years. That's what I meant by get that year back. 
Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to move over to Coach uh, Avi. Um, can you talk about what's happening in a little more detail in the Division II world, specifically um, even to your program, and then in general what's happening from the coaches and programs that you know around the country? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is not only D2. I think it's the majority of the schools in the country um, that are suffering financially. And what happened, I'm happy for Coach Hill that he can have the 4.5 plus the, the seniors that not cannibal. But the reality for most schools that if I want to bring one of my seniors back, um, even though she doesn't count um, for uh, equivalency, I have to count the scholarship. So I have a certain amount of money and I got to stay within that amount of money. So that changed everything for recruiting for next year. And of course, just like Coach Hill said, for the year after, the, the ones that were supposed to be senior, now they're juniors, and we have to see, do they want to stay another year? Do you want to, to, uh, to do their masters maybe? Or maybe once they're seniors and they're done, even though they have another year of eligibility, they want to go and either play professional or uh, go into the workplace. So I, I think financially uh, we, we're hurting. And that's going to affect not only recruiting, it affects, you know, our, our regular budget for a number of tournaments that we're going to play in the, in the fall. There are talks about maybe reducing the numbers of contests during the spring. So there is a lot of unknown, um, especially within our conference, but I think it's more broad than just, you know, our conference within Division Two, And that's what, uh, you know, a lot of coaches are struggling. Uh, we've seen several programs that already cut tennis programs and other programs. So if you're thinking that you're going to a school, you have to really double check that the school that has still that program, uh, they still have the budget that they thought that they, they would have. So there's a lot of unknown. And I think within the recruiting, you got to have great communication with the coaches to kind of figure out exactly where they are now. Because what we thought we had two months ago, now it's completely different. So uh, you got to communicate, communicate very forward, uh, be honest about what you can. Uh, a lot of uh, guys and girls might have now to pay a little bit, even though maybe before they're looking for a full scholarship, because now the whole, the whole scenery is going to be completely different within you know, the number of scholarships that we actually will have and, and so forth. Um, there's always going to be schools that are going to have the full amount and it's great for them, but there's going to be more and more schools that um, their budget is going to be cut. Okay, thank you for that. Um, moving on to Coach Carney, Ryan uh, Carney. First, I think we need to address NAIA and just give a quick overview for those people. Uh, the NCAA, I think everyone in Canada is much more familiar with. If you can just let us know what the NAIA is and what the difference is between that and the NCAA. Sure, yeah. A, a lot of the NAI schools um, are a little bit smaller schools that would be similar in size to Division Three, and so we have about 1,400 students at Missouri Valley, um, but the difference between an NAI and a Division Three is that we offer scholarships for athletics, and at a majority of NAI schools, you're not going to be offered a full ride, but you may be offered a scholarship that makes it you know, very affordable for you. And so in the, the best short description I can give is that NAI schools, many are a little bit smaller, but we do offer scholarships for athletics. Um, in comparison to Division II, um, most Division II schools are going to be a fair amount bigger uh, than NAI schools, and there definitely are exceptions to that. Um, as well as there are some Division Three schools that have a lot of students. So that's not totally consistent. But in general, we are similar in size to Division uh, Three, but we do offer scholarships for athletics. Um, in terms of level of play, I mean, definitely I would say Division Two overall is, is stronger than NAI. But, you know, are there many NAI teams that beat Division Two teams regularly? Sure, all, all the time. So, I mean, we, we play Division Two schools every year. Um, this year, both our teams were in the top 25, and I mean, traditionally, we would win more matches than we would lose against Division II schools. Um, you know, if we play Barry, we're, we're in trouble. Uh, so, so definitely, uh, overall, probably Division II is a little bit stronger, but because you go to a Division II school or a Division III school, it's not like a pecking order. You know, there are Division III schools that have 
amazing teams. And, and that's something I think is very important for everybody to understand when they're considering what school to attend, not to rule out a school based strictly on the, on the division. Okay, perfect. I don't think it's fair for you to uh, compare yourself to Barry women's tennis. They seem to just <laughs> win every year. How many championships you got there, Avi? Uh, we got five overall, you know, we won the last three. We, we wanted to win four in a row, but, you know, they cut our season, so we'll have to try again next year. Okay, well, at least you didn't lose it. Still, still yours to defend. Um, so, Coach Carney, tell us on the NAIA side, the coronavirus, what has, how has it impacted the NAIA uh, league? Uh, I mean, I don't know if it's too much different than, than the other divisions. I mean, it's just a a lot more unknowns than you would would typically have um some of those on a on a personal level i mean if if uh, kids are, are paying to go to school and they're not for sure their parents are, are going to have a job or they haven't been working or things like that i mean that's definitely things to consider um our our team um we've had many canadians over the years uh we're a little short we we have one coming on the women's side next year but uh uh, Canadians have done very well for us but with that in mind we have a lot of international players and and that kind of uh, complicates it as well in terms of you know potential travel restrictions and, and things like that so um, at this point we're kind of proceeding normally in terms of Missouri Valley and I would say most schools in the NAI and uh, you know hoping for the best in terms of you know this not being uh, you know ongoing for six months or a year or anything like that but but it's all a little bit unknown at this point obviously. Can you also clarify if your players also get uh in uh, coach Matt's words the year back or um, yeah, yeah we we have the, we have the same uh same uh procedure in terms of the players getting the year back um the, the one thing that maybe is a little bit different for us um depending on the situation I, I had five seniors on my men's team um and a lot of those players even though they have another year of eligibility um they enjoyed their tennis I think they would tell you they had a great experience but they're at the point where they're they're going into the workforce and and kind of in a, at a tough time um, we might have one of those seniors come back. Uh, he's thinking about it, but but I know four for sure are going to be going to work and, and they're enjoyed tennis, but they're they're looking forward to that. Okay. And so I think for the people out there listening is, you know, um, financially, this is, as we've mentioned, is going to have the biggest impact. I had a call with um, a college basketball coach from Eastern Kentucky last week, and we talked a lot about um, the effects and, you know, if, People don't know already that, you know, the March Madness NCAA basketball brings in so much revenue for college sports in, in all, and it really funds majority, if well, funds everybody's uh, schools and programs and, and has a big impact. You know, 60 plus million dollars in each division goes to the various schools to keep these non-revenue sports like tennis and golf and so on going. So, um, you know, it's just going to be a matter of uh, – figuring out the finances and case by case per school. So um, I think the best advice that we can all give is every school, every coach and every athletic director program will have different ways that they handle it depending on their resources. And so everyone's going to have to dig in and figure out what their situation is personally, whether it's currently and moving forward. And, um, you know, one of the questions I just got in here was um, one for all three of you coaches, Ben is, um, if it's not by default, your player's leaving is um, can a, if a player that's already on your team uh, wants to stay the extra year, the seniors, um, do you have to keep them or can you give that to an incoming freshman? How have you guys handled that if you have to make that choice or is there any specific rules or regulations that your schools have put in place? Who wants to start? Coach Matt, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, um uh, yeah that's not a dilemma we faced we had three seniors this year one is gonna go one is not gonna play professional tennis so he's just gonna go into the workforce um the other two are trying to be professional tennis players and um with everything going on with the itf and atp you know even one of the boys who's like around five five hundred atp right now it just doesn't make sense for him to not come back from a training standpoint and from a match standpoint. So both of those guys are wanting to come back and we want them to come back. So I didn't have any of those dialogues, but um, yeah, of course, as a coach, you have the ability to choose who is on your roster. You know, I don't, the, 
even though the player might want to come back, that doesn't mean that the, the especially in, I, I would say that the majority of schools don't have a situation where it's financially exempt. I think there's a ton of division one school. There's division one schools in power five conferences that the athletic department is saying, we're not going to bring our seniors back because we can't afford it. So it's not just the other divisions or even the smaller division one schools. This is an expensive endeavor, expensive endeavor for these, these schools to bring these seniors back above and beyond their line item in their budget line. So you're talking, I think it's going to cost us a million to a million and a half dollars to bring our seniors back. I mean, that's, and that's not budgeted. So um, yeah, you, every, for sure the school, the, the coach has the right to say, no, you know, yeah, you want to come back. Sorry, we're not going to do it or we're not allowed to do it, but just be aware that in division one, I, I don't know how it is for the other division. So I won't speak to that these players are allowed to transfer and continue to use the year that they were given. The only exception in division one is if you transfer, you get the year, but the scholarship is not exempt. It still has to fall in the four and a half scholarships that that team that they're transferring to, they have to have that available still to give. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen some players, um, go on and saying they're going to do their masters. I saw a girl who, um, who I know well, um, who who just committed to USC. Who's going to start yeah. a masters? Yeah, she from Princeton. At Princeton, and she moved yeah. over there. And um, those options are there, like like you're saying. But it but it's complicated, right? So it's depends on each school and what they have available and what they're able to do. Um, Coach uh, Avi, what what's your situation? I know you said that you don't you don't currently have that problem, but if you or do you? No, I, I do, actually. Oh, you do? Okay, sorry, sorry. Go we ahead. Have, we, have, we have the same ruling that, you know, if one of my seniors wants to transfer to either a D1 or D2, they can. They have that extra year, but now they will count toward the equivalency of the other school, whether it's D1 or D2. So they have that option. Uh, I have two seniors, both uh, top players, top students, just great. And once... The, the season was kind of cut shortly. They both told me right away, we want to be back. We want you to be with us, with the team for one more year uh, to finish what we started. Um, unfortunately, you know, my boss told me that they will not cover the seniors, not in tennis, not in any sports. So it has to stay under my division two, we have six scholarships. So I have to stay under six scholarships. Uh, I already committed to two new players. So I was not going to call them and say, well, I'm sorry, I'm uncommitting what I told you. So I kept my commi commitment to my, uh, to my freshmen and I was able to get one of the seniors. So I had a very tough decision. I had to choose between the two, um, which I did. And for the other one, I told her that what I'm going to try to do is to fundraise for her scholarship which I got the permission from my boss. So I'm now talking to a lot of people to, she's gonna do her master, so it's about $30,000. So I'm trying to raise $30,000 for her so she can come back uh, and have one more year uh, to play with us. Uh, she knows about it, so I couldn't guarantee it, uh, but that's something that we're working very hard to, to try to have so we have both seniors coming back. But at one point I had to make a decision because I only had one extra scholarship available uh, and I couldn't bring both back. Yeah, no, it's tough, but uh, I'm glad it worked out. And um, it's, uh, I guess there's, you know, what we're learning here is there's so many different ways that schools are going to try to figure out their, their situation. And uh, I'm sure that you wanted to help everybody, right? You don't, nobody wants to take a person, an incoming freshman and tell them they no longer have, that uh, scholarship or that opportunity to play, that's devastating. Uh, we, none of us want to do that. At the same time, you want to help the people who have been on the team that can help you win. And, uh, you know, I, I know that there's different schools that have different um, situations. Some of them aren't allowed to fundraise. Some of them are. It's great that you could. So, again, um, players who are in those situations or in future situations, they should be reaching out to you guys, right, and asking what that, what that option can be. Um, so, Coach Carney, I, I think you are the one that said you don't have any seniors coming back, right? 
Yeah, I, I have one player that's considering that, and we're trying to work that out here in the next week or so. Uh, so we had a lot of seniors, and so we potentially – or are going to have a lot of new players. And, and we traditionally sign players this time of year very commonly as opposed to really early in the year. And so it's not too bad of an uh, issue to deal with when we have that many seniors and, and just one who's considering coming back. And I don't want it to sound like uh, my players <laughs> didn't have a, a good experience or they don't, they don't want to come back. But at our school, I mean, realistically, if players are paying, you know, twelve or fifteen or $17,000, the decision's a little bit different than if you're paying – two thousand dollars you know so I, I think that has a lot to do with it in terms of you know deciding to come back another year to play right I think you make a good point there um you know for Barry and uh, coach Avi's women's team I mean uh, the best you know the defending champions the the best uh, number one team um his players um are former professionals or will go on and continue that or, or are very close. Same with coach Matt's there, you know, so there's different levels of the game that we have to understand. And that um, if we look at the mass majority, majority of college programs and college sports in general, um, players are, you know, going for an education first and foremost, and then, you know, they're enjoying that student athlete experience and they're hopefully getting a little bit of money out of it as well um, academically or athletically. But, you know, um, for them to come back yeah, and make that choice of paying, you know, some money or quite a, a decent amount of money just to play that extra season. And it's difficult because they all have jobs lined up. Right. And these, they have other opportunities and we have to, that's the reality of it. So a lot of programs are, are in your boat as well, coach Carney. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I, I totally agree with that. And, and I mean, as important as tennis is to us and, and, you know, we work hard and do as well as we possibly can. I mean, at the end of the day, our ranking is important to me, but just as important or more important is that those kids, you know, do very well in their career afterwards. And, and, you know, if they want to move towards that now, I have zero argument with that. I'm, I'm not convincing them, uh, trying to convince them to come back as much as I would like to have them. You know, we, we had a great group of seniors and an extremely tough ending when you have five seniors and we had a great team. Uh, but at the same time, they, they have to do what's, what's in their best interest at this point, which for a lot of them may mean that they're not, not playing any more tennis. Um, one, one thing, too, just to add to something you kind of touched on earlier, if, if a player is you know, still considering going to college this fall, I don't think it's an insulting question at this point to ask coaches, like, do you feel like your program is in any danger of being – dropped or eliminated um normally I don't think that would be a question you would ask and I think we're pretty comfortable in in that instance but uh I think most coaches would be straightforward with you if you ask them that and I, I don't think that's a bad question to ask at this point well I think you read my mind because the next question I was going to ask was about canceled programs so um you know the question is do you know of any tennis programs that will be you know discontinued canceled um if so will this make recruiting more competitive I would assume so. So I'm going to start with Coach Matt because he actually is part of a program that originally had got canceled and then got revived um, at Arizona State. Um, I want to ask you that question. Do you what, what do you do you have any inside information or have you seen? I know I've seen a few schools that have been discontinued, uh, but nothing 100% related to COVID-19. Um, you know, and do you think that's going to make it more competitive? Um, whether they're canceled or not. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if it goes down that road, of course it'll make it more competitive because there'll be less playing opportunities for, for the incoming classes. Um, I, 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 you, I mean, you get, you get mixed messages, right? You get a lot of, you get some articles here and there talking about it, but I think when I'm talking with friends and colleagues and even even coaches outside of the Power Five conferences in the in the in the Division One, in some of the smaller conferences, they it's not it's not going down that road as much as it's just saying, hey, we need to look at our budgets and we need to really be intelligent about cutting out non essentials. And I think I think you're seeing a lot of places where 15% budget cuts is pretty kind of normal across the board. Everybody's kind of looking at that and how they can you know, save, save money here or there and just be intelligent about how the spending is used. And that's, that's everybody. Those are, that's the top, top brands in college sports, like your Ohio States and Florida's all the way down and us and all the way down to, you know, I, I was coaching at South Florida and Tampa before I came here and it's the same thing there, you know, it's a, Hey, look at your budget, 
just trim out 15% and we feel like we'll be fine kind of thing. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's early to tell that because you don't know right now, we don't, we don't know what's going on with football. You know, football is the major for us in division one. It's the major driver. It drives the, the TV and media rights and everything that we get from our conferences. I mean, you're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, um, and that kind of feeds out and feeds the system. So that'll be the key for us on, on how things kind of move in the, in the months to come is will football be played in the fall? Will it be played in the spring? I mean, they'll play it. It's just, <laughs> it's just That's when right. it, does when football it, generate more money for you than basketball for your specific school? Like 10 X more. I mean, we get, we generate $60 million a year from football and 5 million from football or from basketball. Okay. That's, but that's, that's, that's everybody. There's right. not, the, there's, the, there's, the difference is the money that they're using to distribute to different schools comes a lot from basketball, but that's just the NCAA. Correct. Correct. Cause the NCAA owns March madness. The bowl games, those aren't, they don't own those per se. You know, they're getting money from them. But March Madness is where their money comes from because that's their NCAA championship. And they hold, hold, the, they hold the reins on the $375 million for the TV media deals. Thank you. Right. That, that's out what everybody. To distribute but, to all these programs. But every athletic department, if they have a football program, that's funding the, that's funding the athletic department. The basketball is... is is nothing compared to football. I Correct. mean, you're talking, yeah, 10, 20, 30 X and how much money comes in revenue wise on the football side versus basketball. Yeah. And, and you guys, you know, at that level are, are using your money, your own. There's the smaller schools out there that are just relying on that funding. And especially the Absolutely. three programs are relying on that funding from the NCAA, which comes from the basketball to get anything to their program. Um, so they're hurt there on your side. You guys are hurt tremendously if you lose the, the football. Because right. I mean, you can't even run your own shop. Basically. No, because you're talking, we're spending $100, $115 million a year. So like, yeah, I mean, and, and I'd say the lion's share of that, 60, 50, 60 million is coming from football. So yeah, I mean, if you don't have football, let's say, let's take a sport like Pep or a school like Pepperdine which is division one school, good in tennis. They don't have football. So yes, the money that's coming from the conference and the NCAA and all that, that's their money. That's where they're getting their money from. But for, for the major schools like the Arizona state, Ohio state, Florida, that all their money is coming. A lot of their money is coming from football. Okay. Coach uh, Avi, um, what do you think about the, the competitiveness, do you think the recruiting is going to get far more competitive uh, starting, you know, now all the way for upcoming years? I mean, I've seen for this next year, uh, because there are a lot of uh, players that now they are seniors. Now they got the one more year and they're looking for another program. So there's a lot of high level players that looking to, to use that one extra year. So I, I feel that for next year, um, there is a lot of really good players just floating around looking for um, a good program. Uh, for the years after, I think it's all going to level just the way it used to be. I mean, we have some years that we have great talent and some years that are not uh, as good. So it just it's go with waves and some are years are better than, than, than other. Uh, but only this coming year, I mean, there is many more great players that are looking just because they got it one extra year. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on here and talk a little bit about uh, Canadian specific recruiting. And we'll start with coach Ryan Carney, um, who's recruited a lot of Canadians. Um, he's, he's been up to Canada several times with me over the years, um, almost starting in like 2011 or 12. And you've had a lot of success, but what do Canadians do you believe specifically need to do in the recruitment process to, um, to get exposure and to get recruited? Uh, but I, I don't know much about uh, a lot of things, but I know about Canadians. Okay. Uh, I've been to Canada, I think 17 or 18 times, some, some recruiting, some on fishing trips. And so I'm going to spare you my uh, accents today. They're pretty good though. I have to admit, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, for the uh, 
for the Canadians, I mean, I don't know if it's that much different than people from other countries, but you, you just have to work to, to get your name out there and yourself in front of coaches, which, I mean, your, your web, website, I'm Recruitable, I think it does a, a great job in, in assisting with that. So I, I think that sometimes players don't understand um, how much easier it is now. Um, I'm in my 17th year at Missouri Valley. I remember when I started and people used to send me DVDs in the mail. Um, and so now it's just so much easier to communicate with coaches uh, than it has been, you know, in the, in the past. And I think, unfortunately, some players are still a little bit lazy about that. And so in terms of technology, there's never been a better time to get yourself recruited and put yourself in front of people, but it takes some effort to do that. And, and maybe that means, you know, using your website or, uh, you know, more specifically, answer emails in a in a timely manner I think it's gotten to the point where you know maybe email is like the grandpa form of communication or something and, and maybe I'm getting to be a grandpa but uh, players aren't always that dedicated to responding in a timely manner but at the same time you know if, if they're talking to you they're going to say yeah I want to get recruited I want to go play in college and then their responsiveness isn't always the best and so I think those are, are things you know that are important to focus on in, in terms of you know getting your name in, in front of people and, and trying to you know have good communication with a lot of coaches and, and kind of go from there. Right. Yeah. And, and for us Canadians uh, outside of the, the ones that are predominantly speaking French first, um, you know, we don't have the language barrier and the major, major time differences, you know, a few hours is not compared to kids who are out in the far East and different places. So uh, the communication should be something we got to get better at and continue. So coach um, Avi, um, you know, what are some tips for international student athletes here that uh, they can take away that they should be doing? Because your team is, is heavily international, if I can say that. They're all international. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, you, you know, with the international players that are coming to, to my program, uh, the majority are a little bit older. Um, so when they are start thinking about college tennis, uh, the division one option is not available for them because once they're getting to the 20 and 21 years old, they're starting losing years of eligibility right away. Um, and they have to sit here, so that's not a good option for them. Uh, that's why they know that their best option is either uh, NCAA division two, since we don't have the age uh, limit, or NAI. And once it's go to NCAA Division II, you know, we are one of the best programs in the country and they either hear it from other players or other coaches, or I might be after them, you know, for three, four, five, six years as they are, you know, playing on the pro tour. Uh, so it's an easy, it's an easy fit to come to Barry, good program, great weather. Uh, so that's what they want. Uh, if you are like an 18 or 19 year old uh, international player, I mean, you just need to really know your level and what, what university level will be the right fit for you. I mean, just like you said in the beginning, the, the, the fit is the most important thing. You know, don't look at D1 or D2 or D3 or NAI. Find out what is the right fit for you and what do you want to achieve. Do you want to be in a team where you're going to be playing in the top six? Or do you want to be number seven or number eight or number nine and just be like a bench player or a walk-on? Uh, so really know what you want to get out of your college experience and then find those teams that can accomplish that. If you are a high level international player uh, and looking to go the pro route, hopefully after, I mean, definitely start looking at the, at the big conferences, ACC, SEC, Pac-12. I mean, those are the ones that are going to give you uh, the most exposure. I mean, the, the best competition. Uh, a lot of competition, a lot of uh, ITF, you know, 15,000, 25,000. Uh, me as a program, as high as we are, we cannot, I cannot send my players to two, three, four, five ITF tournaments. We just don't have it in the budget. So right. any top player that have those options, I would tell them, you know, if you can go to Arizona State, I mean, go there. If you can go to University of Florida, go there. Uh, but if you are maybe just a little bit below or you're not looking for to become a professional player or maybe that's not your top option uh, and you may, maybe don't want that traveling all the time throughout the whole year, uh, so maybe a little smaller, a little bit more uh, teams that are 
there's a little bit more balance, uh, might be a little bit better for you. Still a high level of competition, high level of training, um, but just more balance. You're a little bit more in school and in classes. Uh, so really everybody needs to really look deep at themselves and kind of figure out what they want. And then once you know exactly what you want, find the team that can, that can help you achieve you know, those goals. But be very true to yourself. You know, if you are an 8 UTR, you cannot go to Barry University. I'm sorry, as much as I would love to have you, you're just, you're not going to be in the top eight. You cannot go to University of Florida or to Arizona State. I mean, if you are UTR 10 or 11, yes, you have a lot of options. So really know where you are and really find the, the best fit. And I think that this is what you are doing so well, is that trying to help the players to find the best fit. I mean, I know you for many, many years. You only brought me one player, but she was the perfect player for me. Top 40 in Germany, um, a little bit older, could not go to D1. I mean, and was the number one player in Division Two at the end of her year. So it's really about finding the right program for you. Yeah, and I think a lot of people um, need to understand that being a player who plays in the top teams, or in your case, the, the best team, the three-time defending champions that, you know, when you talk about, yeah, you know, um, I don't meet a lot of, I mean, sorry, a lot of people. I, as we all are in this every day, all day, but I only find one every five, 10 years that can be on that championship caliber team because there's always just a handful every time. And then it trickles down, you know? So if people are, looking at UTR ratings and they're looking at the tennis recruiting.net star ratings that they have and stuff, you know, you have a lot of one stars, quite a few two stars, a lot of three stars. And then as you go up to the five star blue chips, it gets narrow and narrow and people, there's few, few players, but where international athletes and Canadians, where we need to get better is we need to also consider and understand that a school like Barry, just because it's labeled division two, you know, it's not necessarily, oh, I can go play there because I can't play. There is a, a lot of Division One teams that you are stronger than, right, that a school like Barry is. And so I know that when we talked yesterday, too, you wanted to get that message out that people need to consider their right fit, not looking at the divisions, right? Yes, and, you know, a lot of people ask me why you don't have American on the team. And the answer is very simple. Uh, the top Americans, the blue chips that can play on my team, they can also go and play in all the big Division I schools. The Duke, the Chapel Hill, the University of Miami, the Arizona, Arizona State, which is great. So, and that's where they need to go. You know, I don't see any reason for a player that can go and play for Miami to go and play for Barry University. So I don't, I don't even need to waste my time on, on those players. So... Again, there is a fit for everybody. Uh, you just really need to know where you are, what you want to get out of those four years, and then just find three, four, five good schools that fit what you want and figure out which one is the best one for you. And I'd, I'd just like to jump in real quick because I, I played Division Two tennis and I loved every minute of it. And I would not... I could have walked, I could have played at Michigan. So I was from, I'm from Michigan, so not too far from Canada. Come on, baby. And I could have played at Michigan State, but I wanted to play on a team like Barry's. I played at Ferris State, and we were top eight in the country, top 10 in the country at the time. We made the Elite Eight for the first time in school history. And I would not have traded that experience ever for. And I love Michigan State. I love Gene Orlando. But I wanted to play in the national championships. I wanted to be, try to be one of the best teams in the country. And I am so glad that I chose to play at Ferris State over Michigan State. And to, to Coach's point, it's, it's about a fit. And you have to know what's right for you. And I knew for me that was what was right for me. So just wanted to echo that from even on the Division One side. Uh, just my own personal story and experience. I love, love, love my time playing Division Two. It was so much fun. Yeah, and I agree with that too. I started off in D2. I played two years D2, went to D1, and uh, was similar to you. I had a very, very competitive team. Uh, the only reason I transferred, and it wasn't even for divisions, it was more so with injuries and my um, opportunity after college. You know, so like for me, it was no difference. 
um, there is good caliber in every, every league. And uh, we've had a lot of Canadians that have gone to play at Missouri Valley College that have, you know, even played as high as been national ranked players in Canada. And they've had phenomenal careers as well as being challenged. Like, I think it's underrated for people to think that um, Division One is good and the rest suck or are no good, just to be blunt. Um, it's so competitive all the way through that you will find great competition and people are usually taken back and super surprised by the fact of how good college sports and tennis is. So um, I got a question. Um, we'll stick with you for a sec then coach Matt. I got a question from Miron Mann actually of my, one of my junior tennis buddies who's coaching in Canada who uh, played at Utah. So shout out to Miron there. He says, do you find that UTRs are undervalued or overvalued depending on the country? Yeah, I think, uh, I think, look, I think UTR is getting better and better as it gets more and more data, but no doubt there was a time period there where, um, the, even the ITF junior players, we felt like, you know, a lot of, you know, on our side, we're dealing with like the transitional pros, the guys that are kind of between the 400 and a thousand ATP mark, we really felt like the ITF juniors were being overvalued. And when they were coming into our system, you could see that, you know, their UTRs would have to kind of get stabilized. And um, so, yes, I do think there's, there's some truth to that, particularly depending on if all the data is getting turned in to the UTR and they're getting all the like data points they need to accurately assess that person's level. Um, so, yes, I, I, I would say yes to that, that, that question uh, but I, I I like the EGR I like the concept I do think it's getting better over time but I am definitely a coach that I do not lean on UTR to make my decisions on recruiting um, say that one more time I, I, I do not do not lean on UTR to make my decisions as it relates to recruiting because I just it, because of the question that you're talking about Miran like it, I just, I can't, I'm not going to put, I mean, recruiting is such a huge, huge piece of what we do. I'm not going to put all my stock on that. You know, I'm going to use my eyes and we're very fortunate to be able to travel and see who we want and bring them in and meet with them on our campus, you know, and we really do our checks and balances before we, before we kind of make a commitment like that. But to your, to your question, absolutely. There's definitely parts of the world, in my opinion, that, um are under definitely undervalued and there's definitely some 100 percent. there's some parts where they're overvalued for sure no doubt because they're getting just getting more data or or the group in that country is already rated here and when they're playing each other it's moving the needle up i mean it's just basic statistics right yeah so yeah no it makes sense um coach carney how do you view the utr when you're recruiting the players um what what do you think uh val overvalued undervalued uh, I think there's a, a big focus on it among players and parents, that's for sure. And I, I, I've noticed in a few cases where I felt like people were trying to manipulate their rating with an injury or, or different things. And, and that's tough to see, you know, or, or players that maybe don't want to play a certain tournament because of the UTR of the other players in the tournament. Um, I would say, you know, try to avoid those things for sure and, and try to get as much experience as you can. Obviously, it's nice if you can play higher rated players, but I, I think that, uh, you, you know, you can definitely get too focused on that. And, and I think most coaches would tell you that they just use that as just one thing among many in, in determining, you know, what players they might be interested in as, as a recruit. Um, by the same token, I don't think that, you know, if, if you're, if you look at your UTR and you look at a team and, and your UTR is two tenths of a point higher than your, their number one player, I don't think you can look at that and say, Oh yeah, if I go there, I'm going to play number one. Uh, not, not at all. Uh, and I think that's, the, you know, by the same token, if you're two tenths of a point away from being number six, uh, I don't think you could say, hey, I'm not going to be in the top six. Um, there's definitely some variance there. And, and a lot of, you know, how it comes out in the end depends on, on the work that you put in once you arrive on campus. But as a general, uh, you know, good thing to look at, I, I think it's great. You know, maybe you're, if you're a men's player and your UTR is a 12, 12 is a great UTR. If you want to go to Arizona State, it's probably not great. Uh, so, so it's all just kind of relative in terms of, you know, the schools you're looking at. For sure. And coach Avi, what's your take on this? 
Yeah, you know, I, I use it as one of the tools just to evaluate the players, but, you know, I don't put that much significance into it. Um, we look at all the other ranking, the ITF ranking, the ITF junior ranking, WTA ranking, and then once we really like someone, after we talk to them, we talk to the coaches, uh, usually some of our players maybe know them and they can give us a little bit of uh, information about them. Um, we usually, we cannot fly to different countries to see them actually in action, but we can bring them on campus for a couple of days. And with Division Two, we actually can have them on our courts practicing with us. So we can see them right in front of us, you know, for a couple of hours, let them have a couple of sets or other things. So we can really evaluate them on court, on time, to really see what's their real level. Um, so we use that. That's probably the number one tool that we use to decide who we want to bring or not. You know, the UTR helps us maybe identify a few, but we bring them over, we see them in front of us, we want to talk to them, look them in the eyes, kind of really see what's their character. And once we have all the, all the information and we know they have the level, they have the right character, they want to train hard, that's when we, we decide, okay, we're going to have you on the team. Yeah, that makes, you know, th this is, I think, a real important uh, topic right here with the, especially my fellow Canadians is like, you know, when these coaches, as they're saying, they're going to recruit players. It's one piece of many tools that they're using to evaluate and start to gain interest in players to see if they're going to put them on their list or not. It's not literally going to decide whether they recruit them or not. Coaches have to look at your, who you're playing, your ranking, the type of style you have, what they need for their team, the academic side. Hello, let's not forget the academics, right? Like there are schools, many, many out there that have um, every school has requirements. Many of them have very high standards. And so if you don't meet those standards, what if they don't have the major that you want to um, study, uh, then it's no, not a good fit. There's so many things that go into it. So being solely focused on UTR is really going to negatively impact you. What you have to look at is the big picture. Of course, it's a good guideline, just like in America, they have you know, tennisrecruiting.net too. That also helps uh, when you're looking at American players. Um, in Canada, they can look at those rankings. So just let, let's, you know, not be fixated on that. Let's just go out and develop your games and get to know the programs and the coaches and they're going to do their, their due diligence. And as you just heard here, you know, coach Matt from Arizona state's got a budget to fly around and find, you know, look at those players. Uh, coach Avi is going to ask them to come in for, for, um, tryouts. You know, Coach Cardi might make a trip or go to events and exposure camps and showcases, or, and they might all do that and see players. So there's always an opportunity to get seen. It's very important to get seen somehow, some way. So that has to be part of your program as well, part of your recruitment process and your, and your planning and budgeting. So I wanted to, you know, make that a point because for some reason we've gone down the path um, over the last few years, and I see it and it frustrates me a lot too that you know, uh, people just think it's just a number. And clearly, um, we're not just recruiting off a number by itself. So a um, couple more questions here. Coaches, you, can, you, can you stay on for a couple more minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great, appreciate that. Um, so here it is. What are the two characteristics you look for when recruiting a player after you look at their level? So let's say that their level of play you know, is matching, uh, what are the other out characteristics that you're looking for? Um, we can start with uh, you, Coach Matt. Sure. Yeah, I mean, one would be kind of their, their character. That's a big piece for us um, because it affects, it is a team sport once you get into college and it's, a, it's not a very big team uh, and you spend a lot of time together. We spend a ton of time with our guys. Um, and so that character component and fitting into the group and, and, you know, we feeling good about them wearing this, this shirt along with us and representing this in a way that, that everybody is proud of, of kind of what we're doing. That's a, a massive piece that we won't, we won't uh, budge on. And then the other piece I would say is um, that just their love of the game. You know, we, our program is based around the principles of development and, players you know we're, we're looking to develop players to the next level and so if they don't love the game and love being on court and training and kind of putting everything into it it's our program is probably not the right fit for them 
Um, there's, there's been a lot of players that we've passed on. And even when we started the program back up here, I mean, we passed on guys that were, you know, I passed on a guy who was 600 ATP that went to the number one team in the country and helped them win a national championship. And it was solely on the fact that he was, had played the pro tour and he didn't want to go back out. It was just, I'm coming over to get a scholarship and get a degree and move on with my life. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just wasn't the fit for us. You know, we have a lot of, we do a lot of extra things with ATP consultants that are in the Phoenix area or just things above and beyond that I knew that this kid wouldn't want to be doing. And it just doesn't make the culture of the group is, is too vital um, for us to kind of compromise on certain areas. And, and to me, those probably those two areas would be, yeah, the character of the guy. And then, you know, their, their vision and, and their love of the game and what they're trying and wanting to do. So. Okay. And coach Carney, what are the two characteristics that you're looking for outside of their tennis level? Oh, we lost him again. Coach Avi, why don't you go? We'll let Coach Carney get mic'd up again. Yeah, I also talked about character. That's very important. You know, you want to have good kids, you know, that uh, uh, respect the coaches, respect, you know, when they come to university, respect the, their teachers, respect their teammates. Uh, so that's very big. You know, we want to know that they're coming from a good family. They have good values. Um, and the other thing for me is effort. Um, we hear a lot about, you know, we're requesting 100% effort. Uh, I believe that that should be a given. You know, when you come to a good program, that 100% effort is every day. I don't need to ask for it. You need to bring it every single day, no matter what. It's part of the love of the game, to respect the game. Uh, this is what we demand. Give me 110%. That's what I'm requiring, what I'm demanding. But that 100% effort every day, no matter what happened, Everybody can, can control it. It's, it's on you. Uh, and that's, for me, it's the most important part within the practice. You give that effort with the great energy. It goes to your teammates, and we have a great practice. So for me, uh, that effort, that 100% effort, no matter what, um, it's, it's a good thing. Okay, and Coach Carney? I had a dog barking. I muted myself and couldn't get back there anyway. Uh, I think they touched on some, some great things there. Uh, I don't know that I have a, a lot to add in terms of I, I, I totally agree with what they said, and those would have been my answers. I think the, the one thing I would add is in terms of effort, like uh, I, I talk to players sometimes, and, and what you think you can do and what you can actually do aren't always the same. So maybe you think that you're giving it your best or you're giving it all, all that you can, and you can do more, Okay. And, and as a coach, I think that's kind of my job to determine. And, and that's a conversation that we have sometimes that, you know, people might say, oh, I'm doing the best I can do, or that's all I can do. And, and it's not. And, and so I think it's important to recognize that. And, and they kind of touched on it. But uh, secondarily, I mean, when you come to play college tennis, it should be because you love to play college tennis. You want to work hard. You want to do well. You want to be part of a great team. It shouldn't be because – well, I, I've always played tennis and I'm pretty good and I, I think I'll just keep doing it because that's what I've always done. That's, that's no reason to play college tennis. And, and is, some people might think that that's rare, but it's, it's not incredibly rare. I think a lot of people play uh, you know, college sports because that's what they've always done. They're good at it and they may or may not have the passion for it. And, and if you don't, I, I think that you know, it's, it's fine not to play college athletics if, if you're still not passionate about it. But if you are, uh, I think you're gonna have a great experience. That's some great advice. Um, okay, I'm going to go to one last question before I ask the coaches to give their closing remarks and any other information they want to share today. Um, this one's from Vincent. Um, it's a good question. He said he's been hearing a lot of conflicting information regarding the gap year, you know, that you can potentially take. Um, obviously, there's a lot of unknowns because of this pandemic, but under normal circumstances. So um, what, what are the rules of the extra the gap year between the high school and the, and the college. So um, Avi, can you talk first about division two and how the transition becomes before you start losing eligibility and then we'll move on from there. Yes. Yeah, so for division two, you have, once you finish high school, um, we give you one full year. So if you are going to graduate high school in June or July of 2020, you can actually take until the next 
fall, which is um, September or end of August 2021, that you can have the whole year to play tournaments. You can uh, make money um, if you win it. Uh, it's not going to count for anything. Okay. So during that year, you can play as much as you want, uh, make as much money. Uh, you're still going to be okay to come and start playing Division II tennis with four years of eligibility. Once that year passed, and if you continue to play, um, then you're going to start losing years of eligibility. So every year after that one year gap that you were playing, you're going to lose a year and another year and another year. And when you come, you have to sit your first year. So the first year that you come to the university, fall and spring, two full-time semesters, you have to sit, you cannot compete. You can still get a scholarship, you can still train, but you cannot compete for your university. Now, what a lot of uh, players do, especially in Europe, especially if they are very good as a juniors, is that after that gap year, they start university in their country. Um, they do it online so they can keep playing the pro tour um, while going to school. If you do that, then you're not going to lose years of eligibility. You're, you're just going to start taking semesters out of your account, which you have 10 semesters to play four years. The other thing is that while during playing, um, while you're playing tournaments and in school, in university full time, if you make any money, you will have to either pay it back or do community service. And that's the NCAA will decide how many hours are equivalent to the amount that you made. Um, so that way you can actually go another year or two more years while in school in your country and then come and you're still gonna have maybe three, six more semesters, four more semesters, seven more semesters, depending on how many full-time semester you've been going, you can still come and play division two, be eligible right away um, and, and play. So that's the gap here. The one thing that you really need to make sure a lot of good players, it takes them a little bit longer to finish high school than the normal students. The NCAA is not going to give you the actual date of high school graduation, but when you should have finished with your class. So if it takes you five years to finish four years and you graduate in July of 2015, they might give you to uh, July 2014. Then if you play a couple of years after, they will start counting that year from 14 and not from 15. So you have to really make sure that when you go to high school, you go with at the same time as the regular students. And if you do that, then the year after you have a full year gap that you can play as much as you want. And then you have to make a decision. Do you want to come and play college tennis right away? Or if you are not sure, enter university, enter university online, be a full-time student, and then you can have another semester, another year, another two years that you can keep playing, go to school, and then you, if it's not working for you, you don't make top 200, top 300, and you feel that you're not going to make it, then you can come back and finish your degree and maybe do a master while doing a, playing college tennis. Oh, great information. And uh, yeah, I guess for those people who think they can beat the system with uh, trying to extend the high school, it's not so easy. So uh, good point there. Um, Coach Carney, what is, uh, what's going on there in the NAIA world? I, I'm smiling because uh, a lot of coaches and, and some players, they have in their head like the NAIA is like the Wild West or something. And I would say that, wow. you know, 20, <laughs> 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that was the case. I, I mean, when I started, that, that was the case. Uh, but it has improved a lot in terms of the rules. Um, we don't really have rules for recruiting in terms of when we can talk to people and things like that, which in that instance, it kind of is the Wild West because I'll go to recruiting events and give out 50 t-shirts sometimes and the other coaches, coaches cuss at you, but that's okay. Um, so we don't, we don't have as many rules as, as far as that goes. Um, but in terms of, you know, skipping a year and things like that. I think ours are actually a little bit more stringent um, than, than some other divisions. So if, if you have a year off after high school and you play tournaments the whole time, it counts as a year of il eligibility for NAI. And the one kind of loophole which, which was mentioned actually is that players in the I, NAI, and this is very few people, but players that are very the very top players, some of them will have online high school and they won't graduate. 
Um, and so they might be 20 years old before they ever graduate high school. So then they didn't actually have like a gap because they didn't graduate until, until they were 20. And so they could have potentially been playing pro tournaments or whatever. And so, uh, I mean, obviously someone advised them to do that. That's probably recruiting them, which, uh, I don't love, but anyway, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Got it. Okay. And, uh, D1, Coach Matt? Yeah, so ours is different. We have um, we only have six months from when you've graduated high school. You have to graduate online – or on time, I'm sorry. Graduate on time with your class, and that's predicated by the NCAA on when you start your ninth grade year. They'll count out from the ninth grade year. Obviously, different countries have different um, – you know, like Germany, for instance – Kids will take their abitur in year 13, so it's really a five-year graduation period, but, but different countries are different. And then you have six months to decide uh, when you're coming. So if you graduate in the summertime, that means, you know, if you choose to not go to school that very next August, that fall, then you will have to make a decision come January in the middle of the year. Um, it's it's stupid. I don't know why that we're we're the only sport that it's six months instead of a full year in all of Division One. So I'm not sure why. Well, I know why, but it's that's a long story, and we don't need to get into that. But it's it's six months. There's been some instances that I've dealt with where the player can go six months from the date of graduation and play tournaments, still be active, but then cut it then and not play any tournaments and go the following fall and not lose any eligibility. Yeah, you can do that as long as you don't play. I mean, you can play as much as you want in the six yeah. months. If you don't play tournaments in the springtime, yeah, I mean, they're not going to take eligibility from you um, at that point. And if you do play some, you know, not to get into this gray area, but if you play a couple, I think it's less than 13 matches or something. They'll do a two for one penalty and you can sit just those dates. Um, but that's where NCAA gets a little case by case. Yeah. It's, case case it goes yeah, it's the conferences a little bit on their own, um, their own decisions, right? Cause they make yeah. those individual decisions. And I think like to your point and where <laughs> Vincent was, con you know, getting the conflicted information um, is, you know, where, you're not going to go and take that risk of saying, okay, I graduate. I'm going to take the year off because I'm going to play, you know, matches for the six months and then wait, you know, not many college coaches are going to start recruiting you January onwards in the D one world without you having played matches or continuing yeah. to be able to play. So you have to have premeditated that deal. The only way it usually uh, benefits you is if you finished your high school career and then, you know, you're in talks with college coaches and that, coaches that coach that or a school that you decide to go to says, look, I have a spot for you next fall. And, you know, I'll commit to you this fall for next year. Obviously you won't be able to play any tournaments, but we've, we've made that deal because that's when I have the available scholarship that's going to open and whatnot. And I can't really use you until then. And then it's like, okay, we can work that out. But people who think that they can just take that year off and deal with it during that year, they don't realize how difficult it will be to be successful Without yeah, losing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I'd say that's super uncommon and I wouldn't recommend that strategy because right. you think come January, you can't play and you're not going to get back on campus playing until August, September. I mean, you're talking eight, nine months. That's, that doesn't seem like a good strategy to me. I would never do that with a kid. I mean, I would, I'd probably pass on him and move on to the next kid. I mean, I think you're, I think you're better off, you're better served uh, you know, either going in January or obviously the best case scenario, we always advise players to come in August because there's that transition period where just getting acclimated to the, to the team and the, and the moving about campus and the school and, and the language of the coaches staff and their system and all that. So August, we always is the, is the first recommendation, no doubt. Great. And Vincent, or Vince over here, sorry, I don't know, maybe it was Vincent or Vince, yeah, he said great answers, he loved it. So, um, okay, I'm going to, I guess, uh, close it off here. I'll start with Coach Carney. Can you give some final thoughts, um, anything that you had on your mind that you'd love to share with uh, everybody listening? We'd love to get your, your final thoughts. Well, I, I'm glad you all took the time to be on this today, and, and actually, that's a good sign that 
uh, you're going to do the right things in terms of the recruiting process. And so I would say, you know, just take it upon yourself to, you know, if you're interested in playing in college, try to put yourself in front of a, a lot of people, you know, make a good video and, and really check things out. Because one of the most important things to the experience you have is finding the school that's a, a good fit for you. And uh, Missouri Valley has been a good fit for a lot of Canadians. So uh, we're always willing to consider uh, more Canadian players, but, but, how you, your college experience goes relates so much to finding a place that's a fit for you. And so, uh, you know, I'm recruitable, sending emails, making a good video, all, all those things are important. Thanks, Coach Avi. Yeah, first, I hope everybody is, is safe and healthy and, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to stay in shape and doing the small things to keep helping themselves, you know, in the, with their game. You know, there's a lot of little things that you can do. Uh, until hopefully things will get really open and we can go back on the courts and practice and kind of be uh, where we love to be. Um, with recruiting, just as I said, you know, you want to find, you know, the right fit for you. And I think uh, your company is, is a great example to helping, you know, a lot of players to find the right school for them. So, you know, find the, the right company that, uh, that you feel comfortable, that you know that they, go, that they will be there for you and really have their, uh, they really want to help you. You know, that's what you, you want to find and, and make sure you have three, four, five schools that you are interested in. And hopefully, you know, we can uh, have back, you know, the official visits and the visits, go visit the schools, you know, meet the players, meet the coaches, see the school, see the area. Uh, that's the best way for you to kind of really know, you know, where you're going to be. And, you know, I think after you're going to be in a couple of schools, you will know right away which one is the right fit for you. So definitely do the official visits once they are available again. Uh, meet coaches, meet players, um, and give yourself as much information as possible. Awesome. And last but not least, Coach Matt. Yeah, I think, I mean, the points that these gentlemen spoke to is is – is right on uh, right on point how do you find the best fit i think you've got to think through for yourself like coach coach was saying um you know what am i looking for what do i want do i want to be in an area does weather matter to me does the size of the school matter to me does a, what degree offerings matter to me is playing time what does that matter to me scholarship all these variables you need to sit down and think through and then if you can do the official visit absolute no-brainer um, on, but on the flip side, if you, if you can't, talking to the players on the team, I think, is incredibly valuable. The coaches, naturally, we all are biased. We all put our best foot forward. We, we try to be as honest, transparent, give you the real landscape of what it is and coming to our program so there's no disconnect on when you show up. But, uh, yeah, talking to the players and getting a player view for sure is, is 100%, you know, a good way to do it and get – get a um, yeah get a player's perspective because that's that's the role that you're going to be in on the team so there's a lot of people on this call I think that are willing to help you guys Mike and these guys at at Ace Tennis are incredible I've known Pierre for a long time um, and Tarek obviously has been in the business for an incredible incredibly long time has a has a great reputation and so um reach out to these people that are willing to help you and help you navigate this process because it can be a, a daunting process. There are a lot of great options, great schools out there. And so find a few people that can help you navigate that and find, uh, find the best fit for you. So uh, thank you guys for all jumping on the call. I agree with coach. The fact that you're on here speaks volumes to uh, kind of your perspective and your commitment to this process. So all the best with your, all the best with your process and, and stay safe for sure during this time. So I want to thank all the you three college coaches for sure for, for joining me. Um, I hope we brought a lot of value to you guys. Um, again, this is close to my heart because I first and foremost uh, love my country. I love helping the Canadians want to see you guys succeed, um, do well. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, sorry, of the, the webinar here is like education as you're hearing from all these coaches, myself, um, the more education you have, the more knowledge you have, the more power you have, the more you can find that best fit. Uh, the tools are there for you guys to use. Um, you know, that's why I do what I do and I love what I do. I love seeing the success of the athletes. It's why coach, uh, my call at Ace and Pierre and 
everybody around the country and the OTA, you know, we're all working together um, to help you guys get more educated and utilize the resources that we have at, you know, affordable costs so everybody can experience this great opportunity. Um, if you guys want to, you know, I've saved sort of these, these chats. So um, between myself and, and Coach Mike Hall, um, you know, if you guys want to reach out or you have specific questions that weren't answered, I can help answer those or at least get that information from some of these coaches if they're specifically to them. Um, again, you can find, contact me at imrecruitable.com or contact um, Coach Mike Hall, you know, from Ace Tennis, and I'm, he'll relay that message to me. So I'm going to turn it over to um, our organizer and uh, Coach uh, Mike Hall. Thank you very much, um, Coach Sam Jonas and the whole team. Thank you so much for having us, and we hope that we were able to help you guys out. Thank you all of you for uh for making this happen and um i just want to let everybody know if there's any part of the video you want to listen to again it will be posted at oncourt.ca and thanks everybody for joining uh, especially the coaches and Tarek for thank putting you. us all together thank you so much welcome guys everybody stay safe stay healthy and uh we'll talk to you soon thank you that's great thanks guys thanks, thanks mike bye